This week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast is sponsored by ArtBase. Are you managing an art collection, an artist studio, or a gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? We think so. Well, ArtBase is the right software to manage your art business. ArtBase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. You just enter your data once and use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and much more. They've got a brand new version out with a whole new look that can be used on the cloud from any location on any device. So what are you waiting for? Go to artbase.com now to learn more and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount. Over the past 12 years, the Art Tactic podcast has grown to be a leading art market podcast. Each week we share an exclusive in-depth interview with a key art world insider. As we move into a new phase of programming, we want our broadcast to be listener-supported and create content that you want to hear, not what we think you want to hear. You can support us by visiting contribute.to slash arttactic. Thanks for listening to the Art Tactic Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Green. It was great seeing some of you in Switzerland this past week for Art Basel. My assessment of the fair is that overall it was a very good experience and another positive step in the right direction as we aim to return to normal fairs again. The quality of the art was very strong, which is what you would expect at a typical Art Basel. The overall mood of the fair was optimistic. However, there were very few American collectors, to the extent that it was really the talk of the fair. There were also very few Asian collectors. However, that was largely anticipated because of the strict quarantine rules in certain Asian countries. At the end of the day, it was nice to catch up with so many European galleries that I hadn't seen in a year and a half or even longer. We wanted to break down this first major European art fair since the beginning of the pandemic. So in this week's episode, we're joined by Nate Freeman, art columnist at Vanity Fair. Nate's been a regular on the podcast over the years. He offers incredible insights on the market and on everything that's going on in the art world. And he was at Basel as well, and he's kind enough to join us to recap the fair. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for joining us. How have you been? I've been great, Adam. And so good to come back on the podcast. You know, I'm a huge fan and uh, I'm excited to talk uh, art fairs once again. Here we are. Absolutely. It's so great that fairs are back and things are starting to slowly return to normal, which is fantastic. Yeah. And so let's talk art fairs. But before we do, this is the first time you've been on the podcast since you joined Vanity Fair as their art columnist. Oh, that's right. So tell us a little bit about the move to Vanity Fair, what you'll be doing there, how often you'll be writing, where we can find your writing, all that good stuff. Yeah, well, uh, well, what happened basically was I was approached by uh, some editors of Vanity Fair who had been uh, a fan of my writing um, and, uh, and the column that I was doing at Artnet uh, before. And um, we got to talking and eventually I had a meeting with the editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair, Radika Jones. And uh, we found that, that we really just clicked on a lot of levels. And, and she really wanted to bring uh, regular coverage of the contemporary art world into both the magazine and the website. And um, she thought that I would be the right person to do that. So, uh, so I, I joined um, just, uh, you know, uh, last, uh, I guess, in late August. Uh, it's been incredible. It's been incredible so far. We're so happy to hear that. And so how often are you writing a column for Vanity Fair? And you said it's available in print and online. Is that right? Yeah. So right now uh, I am writing a column called True Colors. You can check it out every Friday at VanityFair.com. Uh, if you don't subscribe, it's okay. You get some free stories, but you should subscribe. It's like 20 bucks a year. I think most of the listeners can afford that, hopefully. <laughs> or I'll pay for it if you can. <laughs> and uh, uh, and um, so that, yeah, that runs every week. And that's sort of... It's an in-depth look at, at the most trenchant, newsworthy art world narrative of the week, basically. And that can be anything from uh, an investigation into, uh, you know, a larger theme or trend. It can be uh, an on-the-ground report on an art fair. It can be a look into a really hot artist and how their market's exploding. It can be a lot of different things. It's really a very active kind of platform, but it's really just the most relevant 
art story of the week and written in, you know, my kind of, you know, punchy, gossip laden prose, but at the same time, you know, kind of a more elevated uh, uh, sort of style of writing than I, than I have been uh, utilizing in the past. Well, we've really been enjoying your articles so far. Thanks, Adam. Of course. Your most recent article focused on Art Basel, and you made the trip out to the fair. I did. Certainly not everyone did who normally does. Tell us, what was the mood like at this year's fair, and how did it compare to a normal Basel? Well, a normal, I guess you mean like, you know, pre all of this and the before time. Exactly. And, and, um well, we're not there yet, <laughs> to say the least, um, <laughs> you know. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, before the fair, I have a lot of friends and colleagues and, you know, people who I know who uh, were either going to come and then cancel their plans at the, the, sort of the last minute or just were never planning on coming. And, and, and that crew of people were really surprised that I was making the trek out there, not because they thought it was dangerous or reckless, but more that they thought it was kind of an expendable fare, um, that we'd be going back to Basel in nine months uh, when conditions might be slightly uh, more you know, appealing. And yeah, some people were put off by the testing requirements and um, things like that. But I was surprised to find that once I arrived, uh, everything was was pretty smooth. Uh, Art Basel was very good about giving everyone their uh, COVID certificates once you proved, uh, proved your vaccination status. And after that, you were, you know, everything was just easy to get into. Uh, there was really no hiccups whatsoever. So in that way, it was probably the best planned fair that I've been to um, since fairs have come back, quote unquote, um, in the post-2020 world. Um, yes, it was not as attended. We'll get into that as, uh, but at the same time, yeah, it was, it was a very, very uh, fluid, seamless experience that I found a lot more easy to handle than I was anticipating. Yeah, and I can provide a little bit of insight here as well, just since I attended the fair, most of my anxiety wasn't about what was going to occur at the fair, but rather making sure I actually got into the fair. And by that, I mean making sure I was able to board my flight from New York successfully. I think anyone who's traveled internationally during this pandemic can relate to that feeling of going to the airport. You think you did everything correctly from a COVID perspective so that they let you board the flight. But because rules are changing so frequently and really just because we have very little experience flying under these conditions. There's always that fear that you show up at the airport, they don't let you board the flight because you forgot to do something that everyone else remembered to do, and now your entire trip is ruined. I would say, you know, Art Basel, they did a really great job from a logistics perspective of making sure it was a safe fare and making sure attendees who are coming from all over the world, really, were able to attend the fair without any or very little issues. I didn't hear of any issues. And like you said, once you made it to the fair, you weren't thinking about COVID really any longer. You were thinking about art and you were interacting with collectors and galleries and and it was just a great experience. Now, certainly one of the big stories at Basel this year was that Americans didn't show up for the most part. And it was so apparent that I'm trying to remember, but I, re I really think every gallery I spoke with mentioned it at least once. Um, so it had a big effect and it was quite noticeable. So to what extent did you think that was true? And with mostly only Europeans attending the fair, did that ultimately have an impact on sales? Mm, that was certainly the case. I mean, you know, walking around, you just didn't see a huge chunk of the American collectors, advisors, dealers uh, that you normally would see, you know, you'd walk by a booth and the person's name who's on the booth is not there, you know? Um, uh, if you get what I'm saying. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> that, that, that definitely had, had an effect. Uh, and of course, you know, to perhaps even a larger extent, there were no Asian collectors or advisors because they're faced with really intense quarantine uh, restrictions when they return to their countries, regardless of their vaccination status. So it's like a huge uh, leap to come. Uh, but at the same time, we have to remember that, you know, our European friends have not seen any Americans in so long because they can't come here. Um, they're faced with extreme quarantine uh, requirements when they come to the US or they have to go through Mexico or Canada. And so I think that to look at it, uh, you know, in a positive way, the Americans did who did come, uh, I think really earned a lot of uh, points from 
the European dealers who were, you know, really, really needed to reconnect with, with American advisors and dealers and just like sort of get back into the swing of things. And I saw a lot of just like happy reunions between people that wasn't really the case at, you know, Freeze or um, the Armory show when it was really just the same Americans who we've been seeing for, you know, this, this, this whole time. Uh, as for how it affected sales, I mean, you know, you go into the Kordansky booth on the first day, or, you know, or most booths really, what you're seeing is already pre-sold. If it's by, if it's primary market work, um, it's already pre-sold. And a lot of times it's pre-sold to Americans. So there wasn't really an impact with the Americans not being there because they were still buying. I mean, Brett Gorby was telling me that a lot of his booth was already shown to American clients in New York. Uh, during Armory Week, they set up a viewing room and created a facsimile of the booth so they could see it before. Um, so it didn't really impact sales because Americans were still buying, whether you know via PDF or because they got to see a preview of the works before. Um, and to to go further, you know, a lot of these collectors had their advisors like really, uh, you know, pounding the pavement, doing the groundwork uh, research, and buying for them in absentia. Um, so. While there were certainly fewer Americans there, I think the American buying was still happening um, to the extent that the fair did pretty decent business from what I saw. Yeah, and so I think this edition of Art Basel just really exemplified how art fairs work nowadays, right? So many sales can happen remotely, and the most valuable aspect of attending art fairs, I think for most people, is probably establishing and developing relationships with galleries. And for this year... A lot of attendees, myself included, hadn't seen some of these galleries, most of these galleries, in at least 18 months because of the pandemic. So it was especially important to get some face time in with them. So if we turn to the art, because it's all about the art at the end of the day, what were a few of the most noteworthy sales or booth presentations at the fair this year? Well, there, there were certainly some, you know, pretty decent sized sales, uh, you know, even given the climate. You know, sometimes you'll see a you know, really heavy duty eight figure sale, uh, you know, at some point during our Basel. And this is really the fair, only fair that can really happen apart from maybe our Basel Hong Kong back in the day. Um, but, you know, uh, Christoph Vandeweg brought this pretty incredible Basquiat from the collection of Bruno Bischofberger. Basquiat, of course, is one of the most coveted artists globally. You ask any auction person what they want to put in their sales, Basquiat, but couldn't sell that. You know, it was at priced at 40 million. I think it was just priced a little bit too high. That being said, there were a lot of, of big prices in the, you know, seven digit area. You know, it's really impressive when you can see, you know, uh, Jack Shaman, for instance, selling a brand new Kerry James Marshall for $5 million. Um, you know, that's a huge number for any primary market work. And um, yes, again, one of the most coveted artists alive. Uh, I think that, that a that's the right price, but it's just healthy to see that being sold. And on the secondary market, you had Hauser and Worth selling um, a Philip Gustin painting for $6.5 million. You saw Gladstone selling a Keith Herring for $5 million. Um, Tadeusz uh, Ropash sold a Robert Rauschenberg for $4.5 million. So there were still some pretty notable sales, um, you know, on the secondary market side, just not the really big, 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 sales that we're sometimes used to at Art Basel. And so reflecting back on the experience of the fair this year, how much closer did this Art Basel bring us to returning to a level of normalcy at art fairs moving forward? Well, I mean, and the reality is, it's like, it's never going to be normal if everyone's wearing a mask, you know, mm -hmm. like, and, and I think that we're going to continue to wear masks at large scale indoor, invest, indoor events for a long time. So we have to sort of adjust to a new normal, right? Um, and like, I'm completely fine with that. So that being said, if there is a new normal that we're shooting for, we're pretty close. I think that, you know, lifting the travel restrictions on, on Europeans and Asians in, uh, in early November is huge for the Miami fair. I think that, um, a lot of people, um, you know, across the world are going to be making that trip. I talked to some Europeans who claim that they're getting on a flight as soon as ban is lifted just to come to New York and see it again. People really want to travel. They just don't want to quarantine. So 
now that the quarantine threat has been lifted, the, the sort of Damocles is kind of just, you know, gone. And, and I think that, that we're going to see a lot more travel once those, those, uh, those quarantine requirements are lifted. And so I think that the, the Miami fair, you know, with, with everyone sort of freed of that restriction could be really big. That being said, who knows what the case counts are going to be like Florida, as we know, is a hot spot. Uh, there's going to be people worried about it. There's so many um, unknowns right now. Uh, but I think that for what I saw, it was a good sign for art fairs, uh, how well Art Basel went. And certainly the people at FIAC and Freeze who were there were very, very pleased with how it went down. Because I think that it, it taught people that a fair can, in fact, work again in Europe. Yeah, and you mentioned the travel ban being lifted in the U.S., which happened during Art Basel week. And that's really one of the other major storylines from this week. Before it was announced, galleries were really kind of saddened that they hadn't been to the U.S. in so long and that they weren't really sure when they would return. But this changes things in a major way, I think, for the international art market. Given this development, did galleries' responses to this news give you a better inclination as to how things may play out in Miami for Art Basel Miami later this year? I think they were they responded with, with ecstasy. It was uh, uh, an incredible move by the administration to, to lift the ban, and one that people did not see coming. There was sort of every indication that this travel ban would be in place through the end of the year, um, just just given the fact that there wasn't really any suggestion that it would be moved. And the fact that they announced it um, more than a month in advance gives a lot of leeway for galleries to figure out whether or not they're doing it. It's not like they announced that oh, like, like they, they wait until November to announce it and they'll be like, oh, next week, we're, we're good. No, because they announced it in uh, mid-September, a month and a half before. It gives galleries a lot of options. And I think a lot of them are going to choose to do the fair now that they don't have to quarantine for two weeks in Mexico beforehand. Uh, though some, some people did do that before participating in Freeze or the Armory show, but uh, they sort of were treated like they were a little bit insane when they got here. Everyone's like, you really... Spent two weeks in Mexico just to show at the Armory Show, <laughs> but now, now, now you don't really need to uh, to to face that dilemma. You can just come here, and and I think that makes a huge, huge difference. Um, not only did I hear a lot of galleries say that they're definitely doing Miami now, um, some dealers said that they're going to fly to New York the second that the ban is lifted. People really want to come here. People really want to, you know, take advantage of uh, the ability to travel without quarantines. Um, so I think that we can't really underestimate the uh, impact this is going to have. And in so many ways, you know, I know that we have uh, Freeze and Fiat coming up, but I feel like Miami in, in, in uh, late November, early December is going to be the first truly global fair since 2019. Yeah, it's fantastic news, and we'll just see how everything plays out, but it seems there is a lot of optimism moving forward in the art world. Nate, thanks so much again for joining us and sharing your insights from Art Basel with us. If our listeners want to find you on social media and in Vanity Fair, tell us, how can we do that? Well, you can read me uh, at VanityFair.com every Friday. And True Colors gets posted uh, right in the morning most days. Um, and uh, I always put it on my Twitter, which is nfreeman1234, so you can find me there too. Perfect. Nate, thanks so much again. Adam, always a pleasure. I'll come on whenever you want. You know I do. Appreciate you. We want to thank ArtBase for sponsoring this week's episode of the Art Tactic Podcast. Are you managing an art collection, an artist, studio, or gallery? Is it time to bring your collection management skills up to a professional level? Well, ArtBase is the right software to manage your art business. ArtBase allows you to track your artworks and contacts in an easy-to-use, powerful database. All you do is enter your data once, and you use that data to generate reports, offers, contracts, and a bunch more. They've got a brand new version out with a whole new look that can be used in the cloud from any location on any device. So go to ArtBase.com now to learn more, and be sure to mention Art Tactic for a 15% discount.